Now, here's Pete Callender. All right, so uh, this week, it was quite a week for U.S. Senate candidate Greg Brannon. Uh, on Tuesday, I guess it was, he had the interview with Glenn Beck on the national radio program. And then shortly after that, he was uh, held liable in a civil lawsuit uh, where some investors said that he didn't tell them about or yeah, didn't tell them about certain aspects of a deal with Verizon Wireless over an app that they were creating. And uh, he ended up being held liable for like quarter million dollars uh, in investor losses. So he wasn't the only one, though, that was uh, on trial for the civil litigation. He had a co-defendant, uh, and that gentleman's name is Robert Rice, and he joins us now on News Radio 570 WWNC. Mr. Rice, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing, Pete? I am doing all right. So uh, first of all, tell us a little bit about the uh, the company and what it was, because I'm unclear as to what exactly y'all were trying to develop. What was the product uh, 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 that the company was trying to make? Well, we were a little, um, I guess, early in trying to be innovative, and we were developing a technology called um, augmented reality, which is basically, you know, if you've ever seen the first downline in football, uh, it's not really there. They kind of you know, overlay it on the video feed. Or if you've watched the Minority Report or Iron Man, all those heads-up displays are basically what they call you know, augmented reality or AR. And uh, so we were developing an app that would allow you to basically you know, turn on your phone, turn on your, your camera, and then we would overlay graphics, you know, whether it was um, a 3D object or maybe somebody's name floating over their heads or uh, the icon of, um, you know, maybe McDonald's that's down the street to kind of help you find it and get there. And we were calling the whole platform uh, Miriscape, which is, um, uh, you know, just kind of what we were calling it internally. And ultimately, we, were, we wanted to build something that would be, you know, on all mobile phones everywhere. So as the technology, um, you know, advanced and matured and you know, people started wearing, um, you know, wearable displays, kind of like Google Glass or something like that. Um, it would all be powered by our technology in the background. So, so it, it would just, all right, so I open my, turn on my cell phone, and I want to get onto Twitter. What, what, what does, Mir- what, what would the product have done? What, what, what does my inter- interaction with it do? Yeah, so in that case, um, what we would have done on the server side, we would have collected all of the local, uh, anybody that was you know, using Twitter or making tweets uh, nearby where you were. Um, so as you held up your phone, you could kind of see you know, your little Twitter icon floating around in space um, and telling you how far away it was. So you could say, oh, you know, my brother, you know, Billy uh, just uh, Twittered something you know, 10 minutes ago, and he's, uh, you know, a uh, quarter mile in that direction. So I could click on that, and then it would open up and show me the actual message and then, Huh. Yeah, respond back to that, or, or you know, do some other sort of thing. So it was very, um, very based on you know your location and what was around you, who was around you, and kind of what was going on. Here. Gotcha. Okay. So all right. So that makes sense then. Uh, and so AR stands for augmented reality. I was unclear as to what that stood for. Also, in some of the uh, the uh, I saw like an email that the, the email I guess that was sent, uh, and it says right. AR. So that's what that stood for. Also. So mm-hmm. um, yeah. all right. So you were the CEO of this company. Were you the guy, Were you the one who came up with this idea? Are you the idea man here? Uh, yes, I was. Okay. So I founded the company, and yeah. And so then you, you go out and you seek investors, right? You're, you need some angel investors, some uh, venture capitalists to help get this thing going. Uh, that's correct. So there's usually a process to that. So you start off with uh, with angel investors, which are basically private individuals. They have to meet certain criteria, and what we would call an accredited investor. They need to have a certain amount of income per year. They need to have a certain amount of, um, uh, you know, how much they're worth. They need to be sophisticated, which means they need to understand how these things work and have the ability to kind of judge their own risks and, and you know make a make an informed decision. Right, uh, which is why you don't go out and you know hang out at Walmart and ask people to invest. There's a, you know there's a process for this, and right. then once you actually have a product, you get some momentum in the market and you're growing a bit. Then you fly out you know to the California and you start talking to the venture capitalists and then you start talking a you know, million of dollars and it's much more of a formalized process. Right. So uh, Brandon was uh, an angel investor. Uh, not, not. I mean, a little bit, but not one of the the, the major ones. I had actually met um, Dr. Brandon back in 1995 uh, when I started my first software company here in the area, and he was my first investor then, and you know, invested a significant amount. And um, you know, over the years, yeah, I kept in touch with him. He's uh, you know been kind of a friend and an advisor. And when I started uh, this particular company, you know, Neogens. Um, 
yeah, he, I called him up. I was like, you know, hey, um, you know, Dr. Brandon, I'm doing this, this new stuff. It's amazing technology. Um, you know, you were the guy that pretty much you know launched my career as my first you know real significant investor. I'd like you to, you know, be involved and you know kind of participate in the ride. And he was kind enough to um, to, to agree to being an advisor and on our board of directors. Did he put money into it? Uh, yes, a little bit. Okay, so he because I had seen a report that he lost money himself on this. Um, yeah, but it was a it was an insignificant amount. He wasn't. Uh, it was towards the end of the company when we were you know struggling and having uh, a lot of uh, difficulties trying to keep things going. Uh, he put in a little bit here and there to kind of help uh, you know pay rent and you know cover some basic gotcha. expenses. So right. wasn't like a normal investor guy writing a big check. Gotcha. Okay, uh, so that's good information to have. Also, all right. So. Um, you had so you were the CEO, uh, and I know there were other people involved here. There are a lot of names, and uh, so I don't really need to get into all of that. But uh, there, w- there is one name that that we keep coming back to, and that's John Cummings. What was yeah. John? Cu- who was he, and what did he do for the company? And this is going to become a, a pretty important, I think. So, John Cummings. Yeah. So, so John Cummings, uh, his uh, his title was a COO or you know, Chief Operating Officer. Uh, and his uh, his job was basically to kind of go out and look for the big deals, the big relationships, strategic partnerships, um, sales and marketing, all that sort of stuff. And um, th- this whole issue with Verizon was based on some of his connections with a, a fairly large marketing firm um, up in New York. So he went up there, he met with them, met with some Verizon executives, and uh, you know got on the phone and was super excited, like, "Hey guys, you know uh, we've got Verizon. We get to go back in a couple weeks, and we've got to do a demo." Um, so you know, let's uh, let's make something happen. And at that point, that's I guess that's really the crux of this whole situation. Is um, we took that information, and um, you know, Greg sent out, um, or Dr. Bannon sent out an email, as you mentioned earlier. It was real simple. Hey, John Cummings just had a meeting. Uh, we need to get some cash in the door. We only have a few weeks to go back, and the opportunity is to be their featured AR or augmented reality. Right. And that I was going to send out a summary. Um, and of course, you know, he adds my phone number and John's phone number, you know, Hey, you want more details, you know, give these guys a call. Um, and then later on in the day, I sent out a really long and lengthy uh, email, um, to our current investors and other new people that we had been talking to already saying, Hey, you know, this just landed in our lap. So here's an update on everything that we're doing. And let me explain what this, um, the opportunity is and what it could mean for the company. And then of course, you know, things uh, have, uh, have unwound from there in terms of what the, uh, right. The other guys, the plaintiffs, are saying that you know there were misrepresentations about what that opportunity was, or you know who said what. So now I've seen the email, and I think you described it accurately. It was uh, John Cummings just had this meeting with Verizon, and uh, it, what John tell what John tells us, being Brandon and you, is that uh, Verizon is interested in taking your product and making it basically part of the phone. So when I go and buy a phone. Uh, and there, and I take it home. There are a bunch of apps already on the phone, pre-installed, and they're interested in putting your product on the phones like that. Do I have that about right? Um, sort of. I mean, that was that was part of the opportunity. The first step in stage here was to go back and demonstrate the technology. You know, right. John had just talked about it, and they're like, "Okay, that sounds great, but you know, does it really work? You know, what does it do?" So the first step was to go back and prove to them that it did work. And then part of what they had discussed up there in their, their brainstorming session was, okay, well, you know, uh, this agency is getting ready to do a, a really big ad campaign over the summer uh, for Verizon, and we wanted to be featured in that as, you know, again, a featured, you know, app. And then, of course, the, the following stages in any, you know, I guess normal business development cycle would be, you know, what comes next? What's the overall potential here? And if you're being, you know, featured in their advertising, you're being featured, you know, shown on their phone, well, certainly, you know, we could leverage that marketing for a variety of uses. Um, we wanted to try to get uh, what they call OEM'd or, or basically pre-installed so people buying new Droid phones, our app would already be on there, um, you know, and a host of other uh, sort of opportunities. But the thing that was, was imminent at that time, we had a very limited window of opportunity to go back and actually demonstrate the technology to them. And that was the first step. Right. That was the key that you needed the money for in order to get this thing demoed ready. Uh, So when you go to Verizon, they feel confident that they can put it into a larger advertising marketing package. Right. I mean, there's only so much you can do with the PowerPoint. And at the end of the day, uh, as I say, show beats tell. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, without the demo, you're just, you know, you're just talking. Right. All right. So, uh, So John Cummings was the only one from the company that was at this meeting? With Verizon? All right. So he was yep. your representative. He was the only one there. 
Uh, he told you. He told Dr. Brandon. And he also talked to the two investors who ended up uh, suing over all of this. Um, and why am I I'm, – I'm missing their names now for some reason. Um, but these the, – the two gentlemen who sued you um, – they were. Did they also have discussions with Cummings as well? Uh, they did. So the two of them, there, there's Larry and uh, Sam. And La- Larry, Larry's kind of the, the key one here. So he had previously invested, and maybe a month before this whole meeting with Verizon actually occurred, um, you know, we were going back and forth and negotiating terms for a follow-on investment. So, of course, you know, this Verizon thing lands in our lap, and, uh, you know, we're back and forth conversations. So maybe I think the day after or two days after, um, John Cummings returns from this meeting with Verizon. Um, he got on the phone with Larry, I think, uh, you know, I don't know, like three or four times, uh, but certainly, uh, you know, almost immediately after, and explained to Larry what happened at the meeting, who we talked to, what it was about, what the opportunity was, and was very explicit, uh, you know, to make sure that everybody understood, yeah, this is Verizon, it's exciting, but, you know, it's, we're just going back for this demo, and, um, you know, obviously you think about investing more, so. Feel free to ask questions. These are like forward-looking and, statements, right? I mean, this is, I mean, this is. We have this thing coming up, but this is where it could go. Not that we're there yet, but this is where it could go. Exactly, and you know, we were like that with with all the other opportunities we had. I mean, and we had we had quite a few. We were working with, um, you know, the Rocky Mountain uh, Supercomputing Center. Um, we had um, an agreement with another large uh, marketing firm up in uh, New York called Allied. Integrated marketing that did a ton of stuff for uh, for Hollywood. Um, we had uh, interest from Cisco, um, you know, Qualcomm and Nokia had, were calling us up. Uh, Nokia actually flew me over to the Netherlands you know, twice that year. I mean, we had a lot of things going on, and Verizon was just one more opportunity. But you know, on our side of the fence, you know, we were very picky and very particular about making sure people understood exactly what we had, what we were doing, when, and how we were doing it. And that they understood the risks, because you know, I mean, you know, when you're out, you know, raising money and, and stuff like that, there's a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of documentation, and um, you know, the more upfront, and transparent you are, then there's you know, there's no there's no miscommunication. So you know, we had a, I don't know, we, I think we had maybe 15 investors, you know, give or take, um, and in this particular case, only Larry and Sam instigated any litigation. Oh, uh, one more point, I really need to make uh, because you're asking about it. Um, Sam didn't come into the equation until several months later. Uh, I think it was maybe September or so. And by that time, you know, the whole Verizon deal had pretty much cooled off. We had it kind of on the back burner. Um, you know, we'll get to it when we get to it, but we really need to focus on our technology. So so he didn't get the email from Dr. Brandon? That's correct. He got none of the emails. His first exposure to it was in a meeting maybe about an hour long uh, that John Cummings gave. It was a whole presentation about, you know, what we did, how our technology worked, um, what we were planning, where we were going, and what opportunities we had on the table. And again, Verizon was just one of uh, you know several at that point. Right. So he made his investment at a time or after the after the point where whatever you know initial excitement over the Verizon thing may have cooled a bit. Like you said, you co- it, it cooled, but um, it wasn't like you all were, or Cummings was hitting the investors up for money to get the Verizon thing demoed at that point, right? That's correct, because, you know, our, our first one of our, I mean, the whole point was to, you know, be featured in the summer campaign. And, you know, by the time September rolls around, your summer's pretty much gone. But we still had the connection. We just weren't at a point where it's, okay, well, you know, we've missed a summer opportunity. Let's focus on the technology and just make it, you know, get our products built. We can always go back. Right. Yeah, because cause Verizon's going to do a campaign again. And so if you got the product done, done uh, for the next summer, then maybe it'll be next summer. So, uh, all right. So, the, and you mentioned that Larry and Sam. Larry is uh, Larry Piazza. Piazza. Yeah. Okay. And That's Sam right. is Sam Lampuri. Lampuri, I guess. Um, and the when I went through this the other day, the only thing, the only conclusion that I could come up with, uh, if true, and maybe you have some insight here as well, that Brandon offered to cash in his four hundred one k and pay these guys what they invested and lost. Um, if that's the case, and they rejected that, there's only two reasons I could see for rejecting it. Number one is that they wanted the court settlement. They didn't get, like, damages. They got 8% interest or something per year on top of their initial investment. So maybe that's what they wanted, the extra 8%. Or they had a vendetta. This was a personal thing against Brandon and you. Do you have any insight? Uh- 
Yes, I do. And it's, it's a little complicated, so, so bear with me. I'll tell you um, what. Hang on. I'll tell you what. We're going to take a quick break. Let me put you on okay. hold. We're going to take a quick break. We come back. We'll let you run through sort of the personal dynamics because that's a big part of this, I assume, right? It, it's a very big part. Okay. So, all right. More with uh, Robert Rice up next on News Radio 570 WWNC. The Pete Callender Show on WWNC. Pete Callender Show. This town needs an enema. All right, News Radio 570 WWNC. Robert Rice is with me. He was the co defendant with Dr. Greg Brandon, the Senate candidate here in North Carolina. Uh, Robert Rice, you were found not liable, so you. It's like not guilty, I guess. I don't know. You know, you got off, right? You, you, yeah. you were cleared by the jury in this civil case, not a criminal case, civil case, but your co defendant, Dr. Greg Brandon, the Senate candidate, uh, he was found liable. Uh, and at the, one of the reports I had seen was that Brandon had offered to pay these two investors who were so mad that they sued that they lost their initial investments. Um, and he offered to pay them out of his 401k to cash it in and pay him, and they refused. And that led me to believe that this is personal. And so explain sort of the personal dynamics here. Okay, so let me let me step back a bit. As I mentioned earlier, I, you know, I founded the company, and I was the, uh, the CEO for, I don't know, the first, uh, first segment of it. At the time that Larry made his, his big investment, you know, we're talking about all this Verizon stuff that was going on, and he ultimately decided, okay, I'm going to write a big check. One of the conditions of his investment was that I stepped down as CEO, and one of my co-founders um, would take over the company as CEO. And you know, one of the, I guess one of his reasons was uh, my co-founder had an MBA and a law degree. And I don't have a degree, so in his mind, uh, my co-founder was, was better suited to you know, run the company that time. Is this Kirkbride? Um, Yes, this is Kirkbride. Kirkbride, okay. Uh, so later on, uh, I guess December rolls around. Um, you know, we had um, you know, some, uh, some other internal issues. We basically, um, you know, we were out of cash. Uh, half of our employees were laid off in November, and uh, the ones that were left in December decided to kind of stick it around for another month to see what was going to happen. But, you know, our prospects looked pretty dim at the time, so um, everybody pretty much, you know, left by the time January rolled around, except for myself and, uh, you know, two of us. Uh, two of my engineers, and we were like, okay, you know, we're out of cash, but we don't want to give up. We really believe in this company, so we're going to stick with it and basically, you know, keep working until we get this product out the door, whether or not there's any money at all. And we felt we owed it to ourselves, we owed it to our investors, and, you know, we were still excited about where the industry was going. So I took over the company again as CEO, I guess, mid-January or so, and, um, you know, moving forward from that point, I started butting heads with uh, with Larry a little bit. He wanted more ownership of the company. Uh, he didn't like the fact that I was a uh, you know majority shareholder, and you know a whole host of other issues. So by early spring, um, I guess he had been uh, expressing to Dr. Brandon some of his uh, uh, his unhappiness at you know how some things were going. And you know, as again as I said before, you know, Dr. Brandon is an awesome guy. And he's he's he'll he'll watch your back. He's loyal. He's strong integrity. And he and Larry, you know, I guess they went to med school together. You know, very long friendship. He felt bad. So he was like, you know, hey, I don't have a whole lot of money. I know you're upset about stuff. You know, let me let me look at my uh, my 401k and see what I can do um, to you know give you something back and you know kind of move on from there. And at that point, uh, Larry uh, Larry rejected that. Said, no, you know, that's not necessary. You know, not a big deal. But he changed his mind a few months later. But at that point, uh, you know, Greg had had adopted another. Um, uh, Dr. Bennett had adopted another child, and uh, he had some other things going on. So he didn't have access to those funds anymore. And I guess uh, Larry was a little upset about that. But this is kind of where things start getting really interesting and tricky. So you mentioned earlier that, you know, Sam and Larry were upset because, you know, they lost their investment and the company closed down. But the more accurate thing here is there were some conversations going on between one of the other directors on our board and Sam and Larry that Larry should, um, you know, call his note and demand his money back uh, in an effort to get me out of the company, get rid of all the employees, get rid of the rest of the board, and take over control of all the technology in the IP and just hire the one a programmer to kind of keep moving forward. IP and being intellectual what, property. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, being an intellectual property. Right. They wanted. Um, the, yeah. They wanted the idea. They wanted the idea man out, and they wanted the idea. That's correct. And you know, we had a uh, we had two patents uh, that we had filed that were uh, you know provisional patents and stuff. And you know, we had some some good technology. 
so he ultimately did try this and i guess um you know late june early july it's like yeah i want all my money back you've got 14 days and at that point um you know what six months have gone by i had rebuilt the company i think we had maybe six or seven people working on staff we were getting um local press coverage with um you know i guess wril the newsroom server and whatnot Mm -hmm. um and i had just gone to a big um conference out in um west coast and we actually had some venture capital interests so you know things were looking really good but larry took this as a threat to um the amount of his ownership he didn't want to be uh you know diluted or had the ownership go down so you know the employees completely flipped out they were like you know screw this we've been working for months we've only been paid you know two or three times uh we've got so much invested in this and you know we're not a lot about to let this uh you know just happen and then of course you know i'm looking at a, we didn't, we didn't have the money to pay him back, and um, you know now we're under threat of a lawsuit. So I had to call, you know, all of the venture capitalists that we were talking to, all of the other companies that we were in the process of negotiating, uh, you know, revenue generating contracts with, and say, hey, you know, I'm being sued. You know, we need to kind of slow down on things until this gets sorted out. Mm-hmm. And then, bam, all my employees are gone. You know, what am I going to do? So we had to, you know, kind of close the doors. And then at that point, again, Larry blew up and. The next thing I know, he's sending out subpoenas to everybody that you know we were talking to, that we were working with, and you know trying to look for this uh, this smoking gun that we were doing something uh, you know crazy. But it's like you know, what else is I going to do? So, are you saying that the the threat of the litigation prompted the other relationships you had with the other businesses to dry up? People backed away, venture, other ca- uh, venture capitalists backed away because they were afraid of whatever this lawsuit was coming. Well, absolutely. I mean, would you yeah. want to invest in a company that has a pending lawsuit? And, and even if you did, there's the risk that the lawsuit would be won and any money that you would put in would go right out the door. So, you know, it's uh, suddenly not a good deal anymore. Right. And, and that's when, what your defense lawyers argued, that the, the company didn't close immediately upon uh, – it's not like Larry gave his money and then the whole thing went belly up. You guys were open for a year afterwards, uh, and then it was it was his actions essentially that helped to lead to the closing of the doors. We were not allowed to argue that. The, you were not allowed the, to the, argue that. Right. The, the judge um, said that the, the only thing that we were allowed to present evidence was specifically related to whether or not there were any misrepresentations about the Verizon opportunity. So we couldn't introduce, you know, a whole boatload of evidence that, um, you know, about the personal stuff, about all these other actions, these other emails. Um, you know, you just, there was just a ton of stuff that we just couldn't even talk about. So we were at a really strong disadvantage to start with. All right, so uh, we've got to do our newscast. Can you stick with us? Because I want to now get into the, the, the trial and the stuff that uh, – because you, you wrote um, that this this verdict defies logic, that you would be cleared, but Dr. Brandon would not. It doesn't make any sense to you. Uh, and this kind of, there's some stuff that went on in the trial that, I, uh, that, that you mentioned to me in this email that I want to, uh, want to go over. So can you stick with us through the newscast? Absolutely. All right, cool. Uh, we'll have more with Robert Rice up next on News Radio 570 WWNC. The Pete Callender Show on WWNC. The Pete Callender Show. What we do, we do not for one man, but for the good of all mankind. All right, here's an email to Pete at WWNC.com. It says, Pete, uh, on the Brandon lawsuit, unfortunately, you find out that a jury can make wrong decisions when it comes to complex business cases. I have been in numerous business-based lawsuits, and when I bring businesses, and when I bring business-based lawsuits, I bring them in business court. There are only four judges in North Carolina who handle those and understand complex business cases. Juries are notorious for making bad verdicts in these cases. Um, my uh, guest is Robert Rice. He was the co-defendant uh, with Dr. Greg Brandon, the Senate candidate in this lawsuit. Uh, and uh, Robert, the this was is this the second time this case got brought? Was was there an attempt earlier that got thrown out or dismissed or something? Um, uh, sort of. So basically, when uh, when Larry decided to you know call his note and demanded his money back. Um, the first thing he did was uh, sue the company for the money. And because the, it was a valid note, um, you know, there was nothing wrong with that, um, the company didn't defend against it. So he got a judgment against the company. Um, but, of course, you know, we had closed the doors at that point, and there was no money to start with, so he was left empty-handed. Mm-hmm. Uh, at that point, he decided, okay, I'm going to, you know, kind of go after everybody and sue everybody I can. Um, and then, you know, at that point, uh, I guess, 
you know, was between me, uh, Dr. Brandon, and then my co-founder, uh, David Kirkbride. But not John um, Cummings. But not Cummings. So and this this is the other interesting point here. The, the crux of their whole, uh, or the basis for their whole litigation is an affidavit that um, John Cummings had, uh, had signed, uh, I guess, two years after um, Larry had uh, made his investment. But that the affidavit was prepared by, um, you know, Larry's attorney. And this is, you know, other stuff that we, we couldn't talk about in, in the, uh, the courtroom. You couldn't was, talk you know, about the would... fact that this lawyer arguing in the courtroom for this guy, he wrote the affidavit. Well, we, we brought that up, but we couldn't mention that there was a previous litigation or, you know, like one of the questions the jury asked was, you know, how did um, the attorney get involved in the lawsuit? And we weren't able to say, well, you know, he was already Larry's attorney before. And Larry had him calling everybody up, trying to find some kind of, you know, smoking gun or grounds to um, you know, come after us for. Couldn't talk about any of that, and you know that's kind of important, I would think, to kind of consider. So, in the the, the process of our case, you know, we pretty much tore apart that affidavit. It, it's not that it was, you know, full of false statements by John, but the way things were worded, it'd be easily misinterpreted. There were several uh, uh, n- incorrect statements that were in there. I think out of the six paragraphs, um, I had two pages worth of uh, uh, you know notes on things that were inconsistent or inaccurate on four of them. So and the of course, you know, but yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. So the idea is that the affidavit written up by Larry's attorney then produces the seed for the litigation. That's correct. Okay, and then then he goes, but then John Cummings also gives a deposition, and the deposition has in these are his own words now. There are conflicts, I guess, between what he's saying in the deposition versus what was in the affidavit. Right, and he was given the opportunity to correct or amend his statement, you know, which he did. And and you know, we felt that the, uh, you know, when when you when you look when you view the whole video that that deposition, we felt it completely uh, made it clear to the jury that you know, a nobody said anything above and beyond or different from what he initially told us, and b there actually was an opportunity. And so we felt it was beneficial for us, cleared everything up. You know, there were no misrepresentations whatsoever. And, you know, it should have been over and done with at that point. Um, and, you know, that was we were happy with that. So but Cummings still this is what I don't understand. Cummings wasn't a defendant with you guys. And it seems that to was me one of the issues we didn't understand either. OK, so you don't. So there's no explanation, because if he's the one who said something that was then relayed by you and Brannon, to the investor, and then an investor who showed up a year later, apparently. Um, it seems to me like the guy who said the stuff initially, he would be liable as well, if more so than all of the others. Uh, so right. I don't well, get not, that. Well, not only that, and, and again, I'm not an attorney by any means, so you know, take this for what it's worth. But there's there's a certain types of uh, you know protections for um, you know executive officers of a company or or directors of a company. You know, if somebody tells me a misrepresentation and I don't know about it and I pass it on to somebody else, there you know there, there's certain protections there. And this is how uh, the third defendant, David Kirkbride, was able to be dismissed from the uh, the lawsuit, um, you know, by another judge earlier on. But, you know, Greg and I, or Dr. Brennan and I weren't, and so we ended up, you know, sitting in court. So, John, the orig- origin of anything that could have been false was never sued. Of course, David got out early, and then it was just Greg and I. And this is where, I guess, you know, things defy logic. If you accept that everything John said was true, um, and that neither Greg nor I repeated anything or said anything or expanded upon that was false, and therefore all true. You know, where was the misrepresentation? And when right. you look at, you know, the evidence that was there, you had this small, short email from Greg saying, hey, we have an opportunity to talk to Robert and John. And then you have dozens of emails from me. You've got dozens of phone calls uh, between Larry and David Kirkbride and John Cummings. And then at one point, uh, Larry, demand, uh, Larry asked that John Cummings and David Kirkbride fly up to Maine to talk about the opportunity to talk about Neogen's. And basically, you know, for several hours, they dug into all the details. And then, you know, two days later, I'm no longer the CEO. Um, Greg has been part of the conversation past his first email. And Larry decides to invest after meeting with um, John and David. So at the end of the day, out of everybody, uh, Dr. Brandon had the least amount of involvement and said the least amount of things to anybody. But you've got this jury that says, hey, there were no misrepresentations. Everything Robert said was as accurate and true. But then they turned around and found Greg liable for 
the same sort of thing, and that's you know it's like you know whoa, what just happened here? I mean, yeah, we were, even the plaintiffs we were agreed with agreed that you said the same thing that Brandon said, and you both said the same thing that Cummings said. That's correct. They both testified that we were consistent in everything that we said, and it was the same. So how do you not sue one guy, see one guy not being liable, and have one guy be liable? You get three different outcomes for three people who have all said essentially the same thing, and the plaintiffs have already stipulated that. That doesn't make That's any correct. sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, so, so this gets so, to the jury instructions, though, I guess, that you talked about this. Yeah. This is silence and omission. And I, I don't even understand what that means. Is silence and omission. Are they talking? This is uh, the jury asked a question, right, about whether silence is omission. And I guess this this gets to the, you know, you can either uh, mislead people by uh, telling them something that's not true or you can omit certain things to lead them to a conclusion that's not true. Is that what they were asking about? So so now we're going to go into what my understanding is and what I'm speculating. Because right. I wasn't part of the jury room. So. There were several points of confusion, you know, based on the jury instructions, the verdict instructions, and so on and so forth. So one of the things that they were supposed to determine, not only about misrepresentations, but also about, you know, an omission of fact, because sometimes an omission can also be, you know, a misrepresentation. So at some point in the deliberations, they had the question, uh, uh, it does silence equal an omission? And, you know, we were a little confused by that. The judge was a little confused about it. We're like, they mean admission? Are they talking about omission? And so it was decided that the response was going to be the reading of the definition of omission from a, a Merriam-Webster dictionary. <laughs> uh, the jury was not pleased with that. They were visibly uh, irritated and annoyed. Of course, they went back in the, you know, the room and continued deliberating. Now, later on, when they actually came out with the verdict, the judge said, hey, I see in one of these, these uh, you know, issues or causes here, you have uh, – you know, no, and then you've crossed it out and you've marked yes, no being favorable for us and yes being, you know, there's an issue of liability. And they said, yes, that's correct. You know, we changed our answer. And then, you know, later on, we were trying to figure out what had happened here. And I think what the issue was, they weren't asking about evidence that they had, but because Dr. Brannon didn't take the stand and testify, I believe they assumed that that silence equaled an omission or an admission of, of guilt. And they, you know, into a verdict accordingly. That's that just it just mind boggling. Kind of yeah. Um, well, I will tell you, there's a story that a lawyer told me down in Mecklenburg County years ago uh, when talking about jury trials. And the Mecklenburg County Courthouse has this little plaza, and they have these four, or I'm sorry, these twelve boulders, twelve big rocks that are in the plaza, and they represent the jury system upon which the foundation of our criminal laws, uh, criminal laws are all based and blah, blah, blah. The justice system is all based on this foundation of these 12 jurors. And he said the joke among the legal community is that the 12 rocks actually represent the jurors <laughs> and <laughs> their abilities more so than the foundation upon which the system is built. Um, it's I mean, it just sounds nuts. Um, so. Is it your opinion, and I understand this is speculation, you weren't in the jury room, um, but it, so it's your opinion that the jurors didn't really understand what was going on uh, with the case and didn't understand why Brandon didn't testify? And I'm kind of curious, was there any discussion about why Brandon didn't testify? I've heard, we've interviewed him. He's a very articulate guy. Uh, why wouldn't he get up and, and, and give his side of the story? It seems like that would only help him. Um, sure. So to answer the first part of your question, uh, I should say that I think the the jury did the best with what they had. I think uh, from their perspective, um, you know, it was flat out. It was honest. It was, you know, on target. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy with, with the jury. The things that I'm not happy with were, A, obviously so there was, you know, some confusion there. They were also asking uh, at one point to review um, a transcript of the deposition from, from John Cummings. They had a question. They wanted some clarification. And, uh, you know, it was basically decided that, well, we don't have copies handy, so, you know, let's uh, tell them no. They have to rely on their own notes to, you know, make whatever determination. It's Which, just you know, a quarter million dollars. Notes, maybe they didn't, but yeah. they it, wanted clarification. Yeah, it's so, just a quarter million dollar yeah. lawsuit. Who cares? Just use your own notes, whatever. Yeah, right. Yeah, so <laughs> we were – I was a little irritated about yeah. that, obviously. Uh, but to your to your other point, so we did have um, you know a, a, quite a bit of a discussion about um, you know calling calling Greg up there to to testify. 
So the plaintiffs never bothered to call him, and we can speculate, you know, why that happened. But, you know, I guess on that Friday when we were up there and, you know, we were making our case, um, we had we called David Kirk right up to kind of give his story. We already had uh, all of John Cummings' uh, you know, his deposition, which we felt was strongly in our favor. And Greg, or Dr. Brandon, had previously given a deposition, um, you know, even before this. So we felt that all the facts were already on the table. There was really no need to kind of have him call up there and, you know, deal with um, an antagonistic, uh, an opposing attorney that's just going to try to, you know, muddy the waters and mix people up and, you know, kind of um, just, you know, argue in circles around Dr. Brandon. Um, and, you know, I, I, w- I, was, I was part of that decision, so I, I don't want it to, to seem like uh, it was you know, entirely, you know, Greg was like, oh, I'm not going to get up there. Um, but we felt that it wasn't needed and that there was a preponderance of evidence, you know, in our favor. And we knew that the, um, you, know, you know, we could feel like the jury was getting a little tired. and We'd already had a couple days of snow and in and out and back and forth. And we're like, you know, we just want to get this over with. We think there's plenty out there already. Uh, and uh, we added uh, David Kirkbride's. Yeah, testimony because he wasn't called before, but the plaintiffs uh, they called me up to the stand and they kind of called everybody else. So we didn't seem like I didn't need to go back up there either. Um, yeah, maybe in hindsight that was probably a mistake because it, it's uh, it's been you know, characterized different ways. But you know, honestly, I I, I just you know Greg's a great guy and I, I wouldn't want to put him through uh, that sort of thing. And again, we felt that there was plenty up there and. We thought that they were all going to find in our favor. You say that you believe all of this litigation was completely fabricated by Larry Piazza and Sam Lampuri solely to destroy Greg Brandon and you. Uh, I believe so, yes. And, you know, I mean, even when we first, uh, when Larry called his note and kind of shut the company down, you know, at one point, right around that time, there were some conversations flying around trying to find out, you know, what was going on. And, and Larry had said that he was going to bankrupt me. Um, he, I would make sure I would never work in the industry again. Uh, you know, I'd be homeless. He's going to bankrupt Greg and you know ruin his Senate campaign. He didn't give a he said that know, an f about the other investors. Yeah, absolutely. So, like I said, it was it was very contentious. And it, it, in my mind, you know, at least to me, uh, you know, Larry, in my relationship with him, he was you know manipulative, a bit of a bully. Uh, and you know, I really felt like at the time that you know he was just really applying the screws to get as much stock as he could out of the company. Um, and, you know, it was next thing I know, he's here's I got a lawsuit sitting in my lap. And, you know, they portrayed it on the stand that, you know, he was crushed and felt betrayed and all this other sort of stuff when he saw the affidavit from John. But, I mean, you know, can you imagine, you know, my perspective? You know, I spent months and months working for, you know, nothing and or, you know, even a little bit of cash here and there. Uh, you know, I poured my heart and soul into to getting this company off the ground and building it. And, and suddenly it's you know, ripped out of my hands and I'm being sued. For something that you know, I felt was just flat out, you know, not true. Which, of course, the jury found, uh, you know, to be the case. Um, and you know, I've 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 backed away from the whole augmented reality industry for I don't know what two and a half, three years now. And you know, at the time, I was being called a you know a pioneer, an industry thought leader, being flown around the world, you know, giving a keynote speak, uh, keynote, you know, speaking at different you know technology conferences. I mean, you know, this was like a highlight of my career and something that I really felt this was my chance to, you know, have, uh, you know, one of those big Silicon Valley wins. And, and I've had to, you know, again, be quiet and back away from things until this whole litigation has been resolved. And in this time, there's all these other companies out there, you know, Google and Apple are all over augmented reality now. There's all these things that are going on. And, you know, as much as Larry claims he felt upset when he saw the affidavit, you know, magnify that by several orders of magnitude in terms of how I felt. Um, and how I've been feeling. And it's like, you know, me and my team and all of the other investors that we had were, I feel like we were robbed. And, you know, once we found out that their attorney had actually prepared the affidavit, you know, for John to sign, I was like, you know, oh my gosh, uh, you know, you're preparing it. Now you're going to come after me. And then even when we tore it apart, you know, the last closing statements from uh, their attorney right before the jury went into deliberations basically, you know, said that Greg and I intentionally misled and lied to these guys, took their money uh, because we wanted to get rich. And, you know, if that was the case, you know, why all the sacrifices and, you know, why all the time and why didn't I just, you know, leave the company that December when we were out of cash? Yeah, why aren't you rich? And, you know, yeah. Work I, it. Yeah. yeah, why aren't you rich? <laughs> why aren't I rich? <laughs> that's well, the point. Yeah. <laughs> he torpedoed the company. Yeah. Uh, well, we appreciate you making time uh, for us today. We really do. We'll uh, And uh, as the, I know, uh, there's been talk of appeal, and so uh, 
will follow you through this. Uh, we wish you the best of luck in recovering from this as well. Uh, and uh, thank you for your time and your insight and the background that you've given us today. Thank you. Well, thank you for uh, having me on your show. I really appreciate the chance to you know, voice my thoughts. Absolutely. Keep in touch. If there's anything else we can do for you, Robert Rice, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Got to do some news, and uh, we'll get a check on traffic and weather. News Radio 570 WWNC. Yeah, I like Greg Brandon. I think he's an articulate guy. I like what he says. Uh, he's impressive in the interviews. He knows the Constitution. Even Tom Tillis said there are other candidates that know the Constitution far better than he does. <laughs> so uh, there is something about you know him as a candidate that I very much like. The problem that I have with the case being determined the way it was, which to me is bizarre. I can't explain what the jury did. That doesn't make any sense to me either. Um, it, you know, I, I, Robert Rice, who was just with us, he says that he, you know, he appreciates what the jury did. He doesn't want to disparage the jury. I will. I'll disparage that jury. It sounds like they didn't know what the hell they were talking about. It doesn't make any sense. How can you have two people? I should say, how can you have three people? Oh, actually, how can you have four people? who are all accused of doing the exact same thing, misleading these two investors, either through direct statements or omitting statements, right? either saying stuff or not saying stuff, to mislead them into thinking that Verizon Wireless was going to do something with their app. You have four people, Brannon, Rice, Cummings, and Kirkbride, four people that were all sued. I'm sorry, three of them were sued. Cummings never got sued, which is bizarre. Cummings was the guy who met with Verizon, who talked with the investors, who told everybody what to say. It was his information that everybody passed along. And this is what's really bizarre is everybody agrees that everybody said the same thing. The defendants, all four of those guys, they all said, they all agree that they all said the same thing. Even the plaintiffs acknowledge that they all said the same thing. Everybody says they all said the same thing, yet Cummings doesn't get sued. Kirkbride gets his case dismissed against him. Uh, Rice gets a not liable verdict from the jury, the same group of jurors who found Greg Brannon, the one who was the least involved in any of it, they found him liable, yet everybody said the same thing. That makes no sense. At all, whatsoever. Those jurors are idiots on this case. I don't know how else to explain it. 